So first of all, I want to welcome you here. Uh, my name is Anna Gridanis, and I teach art at a small private liberal arts college in Grand Rapids, Michigan called Calvin College. One of the great uh, privileges and joys of my teaching in a small institution that's liberal arts based is that I get to work with people like Peter Cahill, who I'm introducing today at the onset of this presentation. Peter um, lived in Guatemala for 14 plus years of his life. Those were very formative years for him. He is an American citizen, but um, did most of his pre-college schooling in Guatemala. So he comes to a place like Calvin with multicultural knowledge and a lot of interdisciplinary interests, as well as language skills. He's fluent in both Spanish and Quechi, I'm not pronouncing it right, which was, is a, one of the um, native indigenous Mayan languages. Um, so at the uh, time that he came to Calvin, I embr he embraced very thoroughly in taking my ceramics classes the notion of going back to study indigenous traditions where he grew up and where he spent a great deal of his life, as well as looking at contemporary village potteries near his home in Guatemala. And that became the focus of his research through several undergraduate levels of ceramics at Calvin College. And uh, he ended up graduating last spring with a BA in geology and in um, a BA in art, studio art, with an emphasis in ceramics. You're going to hear a lot about his research, so um, I want to thank you again for being here. And please join me in welcome, welcoming Peter Cahill. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, let's get started here. Hoshakain, um, Masal Salejol. This means uh, hello, everybody, and are you happy in your hearts? It's a, the traditional Kekchi greeting. Um, wherever you greet anyone on the street or um, entering a house, you always ask this question. And um, yeah, it's always been a um, yeah, very um, powerful greeting for me, um, very deep to me. Um, yeah, this morning um, I got a message from my mother, um, who is still in Guatemala right now, um, saying that, announcing that the, um, our neighbors have started um, the prayers for corn planting celebrating uh, the spring and um, asking for blessing for the harvest um, in the caves right behind our house. Um, and they she sent me a couple pictures that show the um, ceramic vessels um, for uh, incense burners and um, for presenting offerings and candle holders that are scattered all throughout the cave um, this morning. Um, and I think this is just a really wonderful um, yeah, coincidence that it happens on this day that I'm talking here, and yeah, just like a really beautiful image um, to start off this presentation. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, so just to give you a brief idea, um, if you haven't read the excerpt, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the stories of three um, potters in particular that I've met in um, the area of Guatemala where I live, um, talk a little bit about their work, and um, yeah, and uh, I, this piece, um, we'll talk about it more later, but is one of my um, favorite pieces that I think really um, speaks to the essence of Kekchi pottery, or pakok, which is their word for um, pottery making, um, as, a, um, as a form of expression of the Kekchi culture. So back to the story about the corn planting. Um, the Kekchi, as, we, uh, as they say in Kekchi, 
sorry, Jokepchi Kian, Ah Kekchi. Um, the Kekchi people are growing, um, are flourishing. They are not declining as a lot of people might think of indigenous tribes vanishing or disappearing. They're a very much alive and thriving people. Um, and yeah, in terms of number of people that speak the language as their first language, and their societal status even in Guatemala um, is growing. Um, so yeah, we can look at this in terms of population. Um, the Kekchi people um, have uh, very large families and the um, average number of children per woman in Guatemala is around 3.5. In the province, the Departamento of Alto Rapaz is uh, at around four. Um, but among the Kekchi people, the indigenous people, it is a lot higher, uh, significantly higher at around 6.1, 6.2. And the uh, community is very young. Um, demographically, uh, in Guatemala, the Average age is already pretty young at 17. In the province, it's around uh, 15 or 16. And as among the Kekchi people, it's around 14. Um, so there are a lot of young people, a lot of children. Um, and they're, um, yeah, flourishing, growing. They're, um, However, the pottery tradition, Pakok, um, is beginning to disappear, or has been disappearing for a while now, but um, it's especially um, acute now. Uh, and yeah, this quote from a friend of mine who's a poet, um, a verse from my favorite poem is, even the simple things fade away from gold to gray. Um, and I think this, um, the pottery tradition is a very simple thing that is not often thought about, and um, at least among people who are not like us. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's often ignored, and it is really this, this golden treasure. Um, And yet, um, in this fading, it, it is still a thing, um, a thing that it gives um, gives life. This phrase here, "Yuamil uh, Nalep," is one that I was introduced to this past year while I was um, walking around through the villages. I um, was walking next to someone and. They asked me what I was, what I was up to, what I, why I was visiting these villages, and so I started explaining my interest in ceramics and in um, learning about the culture, hearing stories of people, and and um, at first I thought it was um, that my explanation sounded too abstract or something, and and then they said, oh, Tiokachi ji ridbal. The Tuamil Nalep, and that phrase Tuamil Nalep, I never heard it before. Um, it roughly translates as culture, um, but breaking it down, it's uh, Nalep is wisdom or knowledge, um, but I think wisdom is more appropriate here, and Tuam is life, so the the wisdom of life. Um, and I yeah, I also heard someone say use this phrase. Here, li uh, nashke li tuam nalep. The the clay or the earth gives us the wisdom, helps us to receive the the wisdom of life. So I mentioned I would um, talk about the stories of three potters. Here they are. Uh, let me introduce them to you. Um, first, on the left there, we have. Anatol Asik, who is from Kabon, uh, from a small village of Chahual, which is um, by the large river Kabon. Um, uh, second, uh, Kananor Yoch, 
is from Bulbut, Koban, and she moved into the, uh, the city of Koban um, when she got married at the age of 17. Um, and then third is Kana Elvira Bol, um, who's from Chichen, Koban. Um, so let me put this on a map for you to see a little bit the relationship. This map is of the Kabon watershed. You can see the river sneaking from the top corner around. And um, so Kanatol lives up there in the, the top right corner. Um, Leonicia lives near the town of Koban. And Elvira lives south of the town of Koban, where those, so those three dots are there. And other potters I met are represented there by different by the other smaller dots. So there is a large, um, a fairly large community of potters around there um, in different, different villages. Um. Oh, and just the insight there for reference as to where this is in Guatemala, right about the center. Cool. Um. So Kanatol Asig, uh, she's 66 years old, has lived in Chahual her whole life. Uh, she's a grandmother, has uh, two daughters, and um, has taught them her pottery um, style as well, and has taught her daughter-in-law. Um, and she has um, many grandkids as well. Um, her style is very unique um, in the area. Um, most, well, most people work with uh, coiling. Her, her technique is more as one would work on the wheel, starting with a big cylinder or lump of clay and then opening up the top and um, yeah, opening it up to make a pot or a jug. She makes bean pots and um, coffee jugs or cacao jugs. And um, she can even make, uh, which is very rare for the area, uh, big pots for tamales. She works with this gourd tool to, as sort of as a rib tool to open, open up the pot and give it this round shape. And so here's one of, an example of a big uh, pot being used for tamales. Is, any, is everyone here familiar with tamales? Is anyone not familiar? OK, good. In some places, uh, less not, not as known as, yeah, tortillas are very famous, but tamales are less so. Um, so yeah, tamales are traditionally made in this huge pot wrapped in a banana leaf in Guatemala and, and uh, steamed. Um, and these pots are now usually made of metal. Um, people buy them. Uh, the, commercial market, um, but traditionally they were made of ceramics. And they're, to give you an idea, like this big around, or smaller ones are about this big. Um, and yeah, I, I was talking with uh, Kanatol about, um, about these pots and said, well, how big can you make a pot? And she said, as big as you can order. <laughs> Um, yeah, she also makes the comal for the, the griddle for the tortillas, and it's also used for roasting cacao beans and other things. Um, and these are, these are, yeah, um, vessels that are not, um, not as commonly made anymore, um, very much disappearing. So it's really beautiful that she can still do this. And, um, however, when I asked her, I wanted to buy a small coffee jug, um, and I asked her how much, um, she would charge for this normally, and she said, uh, three quetzales for a jug about this big. A uh, quetzal is worth about 12 cents of a dollar. So yeah, um, this work is very, very underpriced. And the, uh, yeah, um, it's no surprise that it's really hard for people Yeah, they take it to the local market, and of course, some of the reason for the price being so low is because of the 
um, depressed economy of most people that are buying these aren't able to spend that much, but but still the the metal pots are even sold, like the big tamal pots are sold for um, 100 to 200 quetzales, and the ceramic ones are maybe 50 to 25 for the big ones. So it's, it seems like a big disparity there. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's kind of no surprise when looking at those prices that, um, that it's not viable for the potters to continue practicing their work. Um, so to introduce the second um, potter, Kana Elvira Bol, from south of Koban, about uh, a day's walk or uh, an hour by bus. Um, yeah, she is 47. She's a leader in her village. Um, she's a very strong character. And um, I had the opportunity to um, to learn some of the style myself of how she works. And she's yeah, a very um, good teacher, um, very confident and um, one of the big challenges she faces is um, the accessibility to clay mines, um, where a lot of the places where she used to be able to um, mine the clay um, are now... Um, oops, there we go. Um, they're now being... Um, well, they were always private property, um, at least for the past couple generations. But uh, these rules are being um, more regulated, and uh, landowners are not wanting people to come digging in their in their land anymore. So they're kind of yeah restricting the access. Um, but yeah, I went with them with the, the whole family to. Say hey, Matt. This doesn't seem to be working. Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I went with their family to dig the clay, and it was really cool to see that um, the way that they selected the clay. I would start digging and and ask uh, about, okay, is is this good clay? And they'd take a look at it. No, that's not good. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll try again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they were really good at just feeling in there and finding the right clay just by touch. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Um. Elvira's whole family um, works, and all her, her daughters have learned from her, um, her cousins, her aunts, her mother. She learned from her mother and her grandmother. Um, and so it's, it's really a big yeah, family project there as well. Um, the hike is one to two kilometers out just to um, find the clay, and, and they, they carry it on their heads or on their back. Um, and it's pretty heavy, because it's pretty wet. <laughs> uh, this is her cousin uh, mixing the clay. They mix uh, a local grog that they also mine um, into the clay. And they, um, yeah, it's pretty, a pretty heavy mix of, of grog into the clay, so they can um, strengthen the pots even in the very low firing conditions. Um, Cana Modesto is her mother, and they, yeah, they make these um, votive pieces, like I mentioned, that they use in the caves for offering, but they also use them in churches and different er um, places of worship. Um, incense burners, candle holders, uh, flower vases, as shown here, it's a flower vase.
And they cover these with a red slip um, and burnish them so they shine. <laughs> Um, it's sort of working. <laughs> yeah. Um, good question. Um, they, uh, most of them are women, um, but in all my time traveling, I found uh, two men actually that also work. And I asked if that was strange, and they said, well, it's uncommon, but they don't see it as as not right or weird. It's just that they say, well, men just don't like to do it, usually. <laughs> and I thought that was, yeah, funny. Um, because I also asked that as myself, being interested as a man, and um, yeah, what, what that meant to them, too. Um, so here's where they fire. Um, it's an outdoor, uh, above ground bonfire kiln, um, where they stack dry wood underneath the the wear, pile it up, and then pile wood on top of it. And yeah, they have it calculated pretty well where um, when the wood all burns off, the pottery is ready. And yeah, it takes about um, an hour and a half or so to um, completely fire the work, which I think is pretty rapid for this firing. Um, here are some pictures of that. And um, the firing is also a, a challenge with um, the access to um, wood and as deforestation continues to spread in Guatemala and certain in, er in certain areas regulations on harvesting wood are tighter, um, yeah, the firewood is less accessible as well. So yeah, there, there it's all um, burned off and they have a pile of incense burners. All right, so that was um, Elvira Boll. Now I'm going to talk about Kanat Nor Joch, who is um, 83 years old. She is no longer um, able to make pottery as of two years ago. Um, she's been sick. Um, but she She's an example, I think, of a yeah, truly expressive artist in her, in her clay work. She um, is not just working in the simple forms, um, but very much trying to tell narrative through her pieces. Um, Yeah, even her incense burners, which are the general shape of the normal, um, of the norm around the area, um, she adds decorations and adds figures of animals. Um, she makes scenes of uh, everyday life of market goers carrying um, baskets and pots to the market, um, jugs of water and things on their heads. Um, and I, I mentioned this piece earlier. Um, how I interpret this piece is that it's actually a self-portrait. Um, yeah, she made this piece fairly recently. Um, I think uh, you can tell by how uh, rough it is that she, her hands are already weak at this point. Um, and she painted her hair white. And I just thought this is a really beautiful image of this woman with a pot. Um, that's kind of this, yeah, self-reflection. You don't really always see that a lot in these areas where, um, where, w yeah, women kind of um, suffer from sort of, um, yeah, low self-esteem and and um, yeah, discrimination, and so. Yeah, to see this this woman who's lived through a lot. The Guatemalan Civil War was uh, 30 years of um, massacres and oppression of the indigenous people um, from about 
1955 um, onward. Um, and yeah, it was a very terrible time. So she lived through that, all of that, and I'm sure saw a lot of terrible things. Um, but yeah, this like this piece is just such a peaceful piece. <laughs> Here's an example of some of her incense burners. They have a dog on top and snake crawling up the the arms. Um, I love the the expression on this this dog candle holder, um, it just looks like it's playing, just ready to jump. Um, and the bird form facing it is actually um, very similar to uh, some pieces that were found in uh, ancient arche archaeological sites nearby um, that kind of indicates that some of her imagery and style is um, is stuff she's inherited and is is continuing to portray through her work, as well as more modern. There's a, a cow there and a guy with a sombrero dancing, and yeah. Um, all in all, I think um, all each of these artists, in their own way. Um, are really um, participating in in preserving that um, preserving and continuing to make uh, that kuamil nalep that wisdom of life of their people and um, as much as they're ignored in general society um, yeah they're really at the forefront of Kekchi culture growth. Um, yeah, so thinking about how we can, how, um, we can support each other through this. Um, I, was down there not just uh, not just studying this for a paper um, t to archive in some library somewhere, um, but trying to act as a, um, a mediator between people and connect different potters with each other um, so that they can share amongst themselves their they're different. Um, <laughs> so here's Advira with a couple of her um, people from Padres from her neighboring villages. Um, yeah, working together. Um, yeah, it was really great time that day. Um, sharing stories and laughing, and uh, the kids all were watching and wondering why. We were all gathered around the gathered next to the school, um, working on the pots. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, but I've also gone to schools and um, been talking with the teachers about incorporating um, work with clay into um, their curriculum and help with leading a couple workshops in this. Um, been talking with the the potters about um, going to the schools and giving workshops themselves. Um, and there's already one of the schools actually where Elvira's village is that um, the teacher is really great. He, um, he's already been doing this on his own. Um, he was walking around and noticed that the women there work with pottery and he's like, oh, we'll teach pottery in school. So yeah, uh, um, yeah, trying to talk with him and see how we can um, replicate his model in other um, other schools around the region. Um, and in my own work as an artist, um, I mentioned I, I was learning with Elvira and apprenticed myself to a couple other potters who were um, willing and wanting to um, show me what they do. 
um, and making some of my own work in response to this. And uh, yeah, one time I was uh, in Elvira's house sitting and uh, making one of these incense burners and uh, the kids were sitting around me wondering why I was so interested in this clay stuff. And uh, Elvira's mother, the grandmother, walks in and asks me what I'm doing. And I said, well, I'm, I'm just learning how to, how to do this. And I like doing this. And, and she takes my piece and looks at it and is like, mm, it's no good. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's all I've got for today. And I'd like to open this up. I think we've got, um, yeah, we've got time for questions. Um, yeah. You mentioned the high birth rate in that area. Is yeah. there high infant mortality and poor health care available to the local people? Yes, although it is improving slowly. Um, but yeah, there is a very high uh, infant mortality rate. Um, yeah, average um, uh, number of pregnancies per woman is about um, 12 to 14 throughout their lifetime. And so you can, yeah, it's about, yeah, 50% or more infant mortality rate. Yes. Um, I think the discrimination is very um, systematic, um, yeah, all around in very in the rural areas, um, and yeah, this is very big questions, but um, yeah. Um, Sorry, could you say the other part? I, I stuck three, three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's very um, general and um, it's, sometimes it's seen overtly in the form of uh, violence against women, although mostly that's in Guatemala City against indigenous people, but um, yeah, just in very general, where expectations for women's behavior is very, um, they must stick to the house, they must not, um, and they're not always overt, but it's just kind of social norms that are, um, have kind of grown into place. And um, yeah, I don't know where, it, I don't know how to track each of these where, they're, where it originates, but um, it's definitely um, uh, part of the, um, racism against indigenous people, as well as um, sexism within the, the group. Mm -hmm. Yes? How is it that you lived so many years in Guatemala? What did you there? Yeah. Um, so I moved there with my family um, when I was seven years old. My parents uh, decided to move down there um, to work in uh, forest conservation and um, community development with the people, uh, with, with the Kekchi people. Um, so they were working for a while at a school and then have now um, set up a um, kind of a biological research station that gives uh, classes and um, classes to kids from the schools and young women. Um, they yeah, do all sorts of things with that. Yeah. Confirm, but I, so 
I wonder, do they have those problems um, with the Kamal makers? Do they have a lot of great Because that's yeah. a very difficult shape to make in an open field. Yeah, no, open. no, it's it's true. They they do, and I think that's why um, that's a big reason, both for the the Kamals and the the large size um, tamal uh, pots, um, is because they have. Yeah, it's it's such a delicate process to fire that they often have explosions. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of like ritual stuff they do before firing or during the firing process? Um, not not really. Um, I mean, it's taken seriously, but it's not a overtly really religious practice. Yes. Yes, I think that's um, a little bit of what I was talking about. I think um, working, uh, um, them working together and sharing amongst themselves is uh, a really big um, thing that can um, help to solidify this, um, especially because um, through this you can, like, like you were mentioning, um, yeah, answer a lot of these questions of like, okay, why are my pots exploding? Because sometimes I would ask a woman, I'd say, oh, did you learn pottery? And she said, yeah, I, I learned from my grandmother. But when, every time I try, the pots explode. And I'm like, okay, well, there are ways around this. You don't have to just give it up because of that. Um, if they still want to do it, I'm not um, forcing anyone to do anything here. But um, yeah, just offering them these opportunities. and. Most of the people that do this, they really want to learn and really, um, yeah, have asked me like, oh, how can I do this? How can I make this? And I say, well, why don't you ask your neighbor um, who does this very well? And so yeah, I've um, been trying to act more as a, a mediator. Um, but also the schools, um, obviously, starting with the, with the younger generation is also important. Yes, for sure. Um, and I'd say the indigenous people as a whole are, are very much doing that. There's a couple um, yeah, political movements that are um, kind of uh, joining, force, uh, joining forces between different um, language groups. So there are um, 23 different languages spoken in Guatemala. 20 of those are indig indigenous Maya languages. Um, and so, yeah, amongst themselves, they're they're joining, and actually just while I was there in this village, um, where that goes from, they had a big meeting at the school that was, all the women were um, uh, got together to um, petition the government to uh, have uh, Kekchi, or indigenous languages in general, be taught in public school as a primary language and not just as a secondary language. So yeah, it's definitely, um, like I said, it's gaining so, so the people are gaining social status as well, which is good. Any more questions? Yes. I a comment. I, I recently visited uh, Yucatan, mm -hmm. uh, in Quintana Roo along there, and the indigenous, um, is it a World Heritage Site, what sort of believe? The Yucatec Maya, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the. the yeah. Yeah, I think the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Maya and the Yucatan are very, um, yeah, um, very forward about that and are, are have been, um, yeah. Uh, struggling for years and now very much gaining traction with that. Any other questions? Yes.
Ja, ja, forsøg. Alright. <laughs> yes. Oh, so, yeah. Um, some of the villages are closer to the roads, but um, some of them are up to a uh, two, three hour hike from the road. Um, so yeah, it's very, and even a lot of the roads are very rugged, bumpy roads. Anyone who's been to Gu Guatemala can testify. Um, yeah, maybe I can come down and um, chat more with people who want to and whoever else can um, move, move on.